Did you know about top five ancient weapons that change the wars? The number one is amazing, so watching till end of video. Before cannons, before gunpowder, there was this. A machine so powerful, it could destroy castles from miles away. The trebuchet, the king of siege engines. The story of the trebuchet begins over 1,500 years ago. It evolved from simple sling designs into a masterpiece of medieval engineering, capable of hurling massive stones, fireballs, and even diseased carcasses over fortress walls. The trebuchet first appeared in ancient China between the 5th and 3rd centuries BCE, and it became a premier siege weapon in Europe during the Middle Ages, from approximately the 12th to the 15th century. Unlike catapults that relied on twisted rope or tension, the trebuchet used pure physics, gravity, leverage, and balance. It was silent until it struck. A massive counterweight, sometimes weighing over 10 tons, was lifted into the air. When released, it swung down, converting potential energy into unstoppable motion. At the other end, a sling hurled stones the size of boulders hundreds of meters toward the enemy. The precision was shocking. A skilled crew could target gates, walls, or even towers with terrifying accuracy. Some trebuchets could launch projectiles over 300 kilograms, turning castles into rubble in hours. The trebuchet wasn't just a weapon. It was psychological warfare. Its slow assembly outside a castle sent a clear message. Your walls will fall. Defenders could hear the rhythmic groan of its arm and the whistling of incoming stones before impact. It crushed not just fortifications, but hope. For centuries, it ruled the battlefield, the pinnacle of pre-gunpowder engineering. But as cannons and black powder rose, the trebuchet faded into legend. Yet even today, engineers and historians rebuild them, not just as weapons, but as monuments to human ingenuity. Subscribe for more ancient engineering and forgotten weapons. It wasn't the biggest sword. It wasn't even the sharpest. But it was the weapon that built an empire. A blade so simple and so deadly, it conquered the known world. This is the story of the Gladius. The sword that forged Rome. The Gladius didn't start in Rome. It began in the hills of Spain, in the hands of Celtiberian warriors. When Rome fought them during the Punic Wars, they were so impressed by their short swords, strong, quick, and efficient, that they copied the design, perfected it, and made it their own. About 60 centimeters long, double-edged, and perfectly balanced, the Gladius wasn't made for slashing. It was made for stabbing. It could slip through armor, shields, or chainmail with deadly precision. It wasn't flashy. It was efficient. And efficiency is what made Rome unstoppable. Roman legions fought as one, disciplined, coordinated, and fearless. In the tight testudo formation, soldiers locked their shields like a moving wall, advancing with precision. From behind that wall, the gladius darted out, short, fast, and fatal. 
While barbarian warriors swung giant swords in chaos, the Romans struck in silence. Every movement drilled, every strike aimed to kill. One stab to the chest, another to the stomach. Clean, controlled, efficient. That's how a legion of farmers, masons, and citizens conquered kingdoms. For over six centuries, the Gladius was the heart of Rome's power. From the rise of the Republic to the fall of the Empire. It symbolized the Roman way. Discipline over chaos. Precision over brute strength. Even today, its design echoes in every military blade. A reminder that sometimes the simplest weapon can change the world. The Gladius, short in length, but endless in legacy. In an empire that stretched from India to Egypt, Every soldier was a living symbol of royal power. At the front line, Persian might wasn't only wielded through swords. It was protected by shining, engineered armor, the battle armor of the Achaemenids. Achaemenid armor differed from many of its contemporaries. It combined beauty, flexibility, and battlefield function. Elite units, especially the famed Immortals, wore armor made of small, overlapping metal scales, each riveted or linked to the next. This scale construction allowed for fluid movement while providing strong protection against blades and spears. In Imperial workshops, armor was forged from bronze, iron, and treated leather. Higher-ranking officers wore richly decorated pieces, embossed symbols like lions, bulls, and the winged sun, proclaiming royal authority. These armors were polished to shine in sunlight, not only protective but ceremonial, a visible claim to power. On the battlefield, Persian formations combined large shields, scale armor, and pointed helmets to form a resilient line. Their kit helped resist Greek spears and Scythian arrows, blending mobility with solid defense. Achaemenid armor was more than functional gear. It was identity and discipline made visible. Even after the empire fell, its designs influenced Parthian and Sasanian armorers and echoed across the eastern battlefields for centuries. Scale and lamellar techniques became staples of armor making well into the medieval era. In the age of great kings, armor was never just protection. It was power, prestige, and a promise of order. Achaemenid battle armor, armor for an empire, brilliant, flexible, and unforgettable. This is not the katana you know. It's longer, heavier, a battlefield's wrecking ball carried on a warrior's back. Meet the Odachi, Japan's giant sword of legend. The Odachi, sometimes written Odachi or Nodachi, appeared in Japan during the Heian and Kamakura periods. Built for open field combat, it was a weapon of reach and shock, a blade often exceeding 1.2 to 1.8 meters, far longer than a typical katana. Not practical for everyday duels, the Odachi was a specialist's weapon, swung to cut down cavalry, break enemy formations, and terrify foes with sheer presence. Forging one was a trial of skill, long steel that needed perfect tempering to avoid bending or breaking. And Odachi's length demanded extraordinary craftsmanship. The blade had to be rigid yet resilient, 
the spine strong enough to carry the mass, the edge razor sharp along a blade longer than a person. Smiths used advanced folding and differential hardening to create a hamon that ran the full epic length of the blade. The Tang, Nakago, was longer and more robust, and mounting the weapon required oversized fittings. Because of its size, the Odachi was often carried on the back or transported on poles. Not quick to draw, but devastating when wielded by a trained wielder. In battle, the Odachi excelled at breaking charges and cutting through massed troops. It required strength, timing, and a team for transport. Sometimes two men even trained to fight with it. Outside combat, Odachi also took on ceremonial roles. Gigantic blades were offered at shrines as symbols of power and protection. Their myths grew with each swing. Warrior heroes and monsters felled by a single sweeping stroke. The Odachi is a symbol of extremes. Extremes of craft, of warfare, and of human will. It wasn't practical for every samurai, but its existence proves how far artisans and warriors pushed the limits of steel. Want a deep dive on how an Odachi was forged and wielded, with slow motion strikes and smith shop secrets? Hit like, subscribe. Imagine a fire so fierce it burned on water. A secret weapon that turned wooden fleets into floating pyres. This is Greek fire, Byzantium's terrifying answer to invasion. First used in the 7th century during sieges of the Byzantine Empire, Greek fire was a closely guarded military secret. Fired from bronze tubes mounted on ships or towers, it could be sprayed like a jet, turning enemy decks into infernos and shattering morale in an instant. The exact formula is lost. Scribes and imperial engineers kept it secret. Ancient sources hint at a petroleum-based mixture, possibly combined with sulfur, resin, or quicklime fed into a pressurized nozzle. Some accounts describe a burning substance that continued to blaze on water, unlike anything until modern incendiaries. Modern experiments can recreate napalm-like mixtures that behave similarly, but nobody has uncovered the original recipe. That secrecy was the weapon's power, fear of the unknown, Greek fire didn't just damage ships, it shattered morale. In multiple sieges, it turned entire assaults into routs. Its reputation spread faster than the flames themselves, and opponents sometimes fled at the sight of Byzantine vessels alone. It was psychological warfare as much as it was physical. Centuries later, historians and chemists still debate the composition. Was it primitive chemistry, clever engineering, or both? Whatever the answer, Greek fire gave Byzantium a technological edge and earned its place as one of history's most feared weapons. Want a full breakdown of modern tests that tried to recreate Greek fire? Hit like, Subscribe, and I'll bring the lab reports next.